So case two, just really quickly, in the interest of time, um, this was a young lady. She came in with a rash all over her body, but it didn't look that bad. It looked like this picture in the upper left, which actually looks pretty disgusting, but it's not the real patient. But when she first started, it was just a few of these on her legs and stomach. It gradually began to progress all over her body and face, and then her lips started to look like this. Um, at this stage, we decided airway management would probably be a good thing for her because she had gone from you know, a nice thin neck to now starting to get these jolly things there, and her skin is excoriating in front of us. She was toxic epidermal necrolysis. How are you going to intubate this patient? <coughs> Anyone? You never go wrong calling anesthesia, but what I'm going to tell you in this lecture is that we have the ability to do this stuff. Now, having backup, I'm never going to argue with you, but, you know, she was breathing fine. You know, her sat was great. What was scaring me is just her airway tissues. But there's another opportunity for us to be a little more elegant, and that's what brings us to awake intubation. So why is awake intubation a good idea? Awake intubation is a good idea because you're not taking away any of this good stuff that was going on before you gave your Tomidane and sucks. The patient is breathing well, you, they will continue to do so, and yet you can still put it in a tracheal tube through their cords. So this forces you to go back to your airway algorithm. How many folks have read Cover to Cover Ron Wall's book? All right, so you know, we had met like I think two months ago and I told you, you know, if you're not reading this stuff, then you're, you're actually sacrificing your own education. And I'll say it again. You own the book that was given to you. you. Just read it cover to cover. It's, it's potentially, you know, practice changing. Or take his course, but you have the book. It's free. So you guys should know this backwards and forwards. But you get to a patient who needs intubation for whichever of the reasons. Um, and then they can be crash, which means you don't have a choice in the matter. They're dying in front of you or they're unresponsive. They need a tube. And then predict difficult airway. And if it's a difficult airway, you go to the difficult airway algorithm. If it's not, you do RSI. The difficult airway algorithm tells you, do you think you could bag them? And if you think you can, then you don't have to move to your failed airway mechanisms. <coughs> and then they have, which I've always found to be a problem, this should, just should not be here. This should be part of the whole awake intubation attempt, because they really are the same thing. But they say consider blind nasal um, intubation. Now, if you take an awake patient who's you know, talking to you, like our GI bleeder, you can't do a blind nasal intubation without doing all the steps of awake intubation I'm going to tell you about. So I think this was always a kind of weird placement of that. Um, if you have an obtunded patient who's not quite crash, um, but for some reason, you know, you want to stick something in their nose, I guess you can do it. But it, this the placement of this was always um, difficult for me to understand. So now you come down here, BVM predicted to be successful. Uh, and, and that's always you know, up in the air for me. I, I think if you don't think you're going to be able to easily intubate them and you're not sure, then you should do them awake, w regardless of whether you think you could bag them or not. I, I just don't think it's worth putting you, yourself in that situation if you don't have to. So then you get to where we're going to talk about today, awake laryngoscopy, which probably should be all the patients you anticipate difficulty on. So I could say this a bit more easily by there's only three types of airways you're going to deal with. There's the crash airways, and those, you don't have a choice. You're going to do RSI um, because they're forcing your hand. And if you're going to do it, you might as well put the paralytics on board. It's going to increase your first pass intubation success. Now, if you tell me you have someone who's you know, actually coding, do we still need to push suck? Sure, don't. But if you have any question in your mind, if there's any question, the patient might have some blood pressure and therefore some muscle tone, just push the sucks. It's just, it's not worth making things harder. So crash, paralytics. RSI, we know, paralytics, because sedative-only intubations are not as successful. And then the last category is awake. So in order to get to the point where you're going to do an awake intubation, you have to first assess if the airway is difficult. And you know the whole lemon law. I'm not going to go through it. The point is, you could have looked at either of these two patients, you know, our obese uh, GI bleeder or our, our uh, 10 patient, and say that they're probably going to be difficult. Or at least I thought so. I mean, I looked at this guy when I walked in, the GI bleeder and said, this is not going to necessarily be an easy intubation. Now, sometimes you'll be wrong. You'll be happily, you know, surprised to say someone you thought was difficult turned out to be really easy. But I'd rather just take the course of being prepared for the difficulty. Both of those guys probably should have been done awake because by body habitus or situation, they were difficult. You're supposed to look to see if they're difficult to bag. And that's this whole um, bones mnemonic. You find us all in Ron's book. 
This he's speaking about. Ron's been lecturing about the new fourth assessment, which is difficult to place um, epi uh, extraglottic device like LMAs, but I haven't heard a mnemonic yet. Andy, does Ron put a fourth in mnemonic yet for difficult LMA insertion? I don't think so. No, I haven't heard the mnemonic, but this is what the data he's taking it from tells you. It's tough to stick in, you know, mouth closure or, you know, mouth is, you know, jammed shut by trauma, inability to pro properly position because of airway disanatomy or um, something's wrong with the cords, and then inability to maintain a seal or ventilate, which would be lung pathology or some kind of chest wall trauma. And then you're supposed to assess whether it's easy crike, and this is a mnemonic for that, but all these you also could do by gestalt. You could just say, oh, this guy, you know, there's no neck, he's probably going to be a difficult crike, right? So, you know, having these are excellent, and I, I ask you to learn them, but it's the same thing with PE. If you become experienced, you begin to just look at a situation and say, high risk, low risk. And it's the same thing with difficult airway. Let's say you've determined that this is going to be a difficult airway, and you don't want to paralyze them. At that point, you're going to do an awake intubation. And what an awake intubation really consists of is drawing them out, topicalizing, sedating the patient, and then intubating them, and then normal post-tube management. So drying them out. And this is, this is the step that gets missed. Uh, I, I was working on that. I saw high PTSD there. I, what is it? You go back and see there's high PTSD. That's an exciting prospect. Uh, I, I was thinking uh, DT SIP, which, you know, the Delirium Tremens guys get it because they like to drink. Um, that was, you know, the one, but I'm not very, you know, I'm not mnemonic based in terms of my learning, so I don't put them by. I, anyone who wants to develop a good mnemonic, I think, you know, that'd be great. You could even name it. Put on site. All right, so drying them out. You need an antiselic. None of this stuff we're going to talk about is going to work if the patient has moist mucosa. Uh, it's just going to be absolutely useless. So you have to give an antisalagog, and you have to give it early. Um, we all are familiar with atropine. Atropine has a lot of side effects. Um, they get a lot of central effects because atropine crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, glycopyrrolate does not. Glycopyrrolate is very common in anesthesia, and we don't use it very often at all. Yes? Can you talk about what are the side effects of being to people? What are, oh. what are the commonly known things about glycopyrrolate? You give it, there's a downside to it. Well, let, let's talk about the downsides of atropine. They're more relevant first, which just, you know, the central effects um, can make people loopy, right? I mean, this is the mad as the hatter syndrome. And then, you know, they're going to become fairly tachycardic. Um, glycopyrrolate won't cross the blood-brain barrier, so you're going to get none of the loopiness, and the tachycardia is a little bit more attenuated. Um, but the side effects for both are essentially the same. Their heart rate beat a little bit quicker. But we're not talking, you know, profound tachycardias because it's just a vagal lytic. It's just taking away your vagal tone. It's not adding sympathetic tone. So you're just going to eliminate whatever was keeping their heart rate at 60 and now maybe go to 80 or 90. It might also unmask the bad stuff going on with your patient, which is never a bad thing. I mean, if the patient all of a sudden is going 130 after getting glycopyrrolate, it's not the glycopyrrolate. It's something bad's going on that the vagus was masking to some extent. So the dose, just don't remember weight base for this, it's not worth it, just remember 0.2, a fifth of a milligram uh, is all you need. And you should probably have it in your department. You probably should make a difficult airway cart that has all the stuff you need for wake intubation. We've only been talking about that for a while now. Um, Elmhurst, we have it, your glycopyrrolates in the difficult airway cart. So atropine in a pinch, but glycopyrrolate far, far better. And um, the key with these is just you have to give them early, so you have to anticipate a bit. What you need is about 15 minutes for ideal um, anti-salagog effect. Uh, five minutes will do it, but one minute won't. So at least five minutes before you're going to start all this, you have to give the glycopyrrolate, and the sooner you give it, the better. If you give it, and then you decide, oh, I'm just going to do RSI, nothing bad has happened. So just, if you have any question of whether it might be an awake intubation, just push the glycopyrrolate. If you're a kid and you decide you want to move to RSI, and you're giving glycopyrrolate, does that satisfy your requirement for it, It's an interesting question. I would intuit that it might, but I have no idea how to properly answer that question because I stopped learning about kids um, the second residency was over. I think because it's more selective and has less of a cardiac effect, it probably doesn't. And I think you're giving the atropine to prevent the rate of cardiac So, uh, uh, it, It's vagalytic effect, Andy, is, is at least as good. Um, My understanding is the only difference is that the atropine doesn't cross yet. Yeah, that probably doesn't cross yeah. the blood so, so I, again, I would intuit it would work just fine. 
Um, and I think the anesthesiologists usually use the glycopyrrolate for that purpose, but I don't want to give you any definitive answer. Next, you have to pretend you're in the dentist's office because the glycopyrrolate would just stop the new secretions from forming. But when you're actually ready to start all this, what you want to do is suck out their whole mouth, you know. And you could, you know, leave it in there and tell them to spit. But um, you just suck out their whole mouth with a suction catheter. And then I actually like to take a 4x4 four four and just run it on their tongue and inside their cheeks to get every last bit of moisture. You want these guys parched. You want them miserable with their desire to, you know, rinse their mouth out. That dry will get you very good topical anesthesia. Right. The next step is topicalization. Now, there's, when, I, when I learned how to do awake fiber optic bronchoscopy, we did a whole bunch of nerve blocks. Um, and they're, they're cute. It's fun to learn. Unnecessary. I, this is going to be something you get to do like once or twice a year. Don't, don't stick with hard stuff that you need to remember or look up in a textbook. So I'm going to give you a purely topical approach to the airway anesthesia. So these are the nerves that need to be blocked. The trigem is really just for nasotracheal intubations. You don't have to worry about that at all because we're going to talk only about oral approaches today. Um, the glossopharyngeal takes your entire mouth and then all the way up to the top of your epiglottis. And then the vagal, via the superior laryngeal nerve, gets the underside of your epiglottis and then your trachea and the lower portion of your cords. Um, so those, are, those yellow and pink are really the nerves we're dealing with here. So the first, time, uh, first part of this is you're going to black off your glossopharyngeal um, anatomy. And the way to do that easiest is by nebulizing lidocaine. Now, if we had 4% lidocaine, this works a lot better um, for everything we're going to talk about. It's not readily available in most EDs. And in fact, Elmhurst lost their supplier and never picked it up again. Um, so anesthesia is actually special ordering their own 4%, so we don't have access to that. 2% will work. So if you just have the regular 2% in the department, it's fine. Um, I'd go without epi. If you had only epi, it would be fine in these circumstances. Though if they're a really old person, they can get some systemic absorption of epi, so without is probably safer. All you're going to do is, for the 2%, you're going to take 6 cc's of it. You're going to put in a regular nebulizer. You're going to put it on the patient's face, either by a mouthpiece or an oxygen mask. Either one is fine, just like you're doing an albuterol nib. Now, the key, though, is you want to keep the flow rate low. You want to keep it 4 or 5 liters per minute on your oxygen gauge, because otherwise the, the nebulization is such that the, the, the particles are small, which is how they're supposed to be to get down to the lungs. But you don't want small particles. You want large particles that are going to stick to the upper airway. So you want to keep your nebulizer low. And that'll, because the way it works is the more the oxygen flow, the smaller the albuterol gets broken up into. Same thing for the lidocaine. So keep four or five on your flow meter on the wall, and you'll be fine. You can, if you could find it, get lidocaine spray and use that instead. Um, there's a mucosal atomization device, which is just attaches to a syringe. And when you squeeze the syringe, it forces a very thin cloud, uh, you know, a, a, for all intents and purposes, nebulized cloud of whatever's in there. So you can do your lidocaine that way. I see your question. I'll get to you in a sec. Um, and then you could do something in the posterior pharynx, which we'll talk about in a sec. Don't use this anymore. Um, I just, the reports of methemoglobinemia have just been so rampant lately um, that I don't think it's worth it. The gain's not there. You're supposed to only spray this for one second. That's like the maximum cetacane or hurricane spray you're supposed to use. And you just can't anesthetize an airway like that. You, you just want to keep spraying. And that's going to cause methemoglobinemia. Don't, I don't think it's worth it at this point. We have better ways. This is the mucosal atomization device, the MAD device. Um, I have a couple of these hidden in Elmhurst for myself, but it hasn't been put on the order tree yet. It will be, and then they'll be in the difficult airway cart. But these are great. You just take a syringe, and a, which is just a normal syringe, and attach this, and then whatever you spray out comes in a very fine mist, and you can spray the entire airway with that. Now, did that answer your question, Mark? Or you still have, okay, great. All right. Next, to try to get the top portion of the epiglottis and sometimes even get into... Um, the cords themselves, I make a lidocaine lollipop. And all that is, is you take a tongue depressor and you put a big squirt of lidocaine ointment. Now, it'd be nice if we had the 5%. Um, most of our shops don't have it. We have the 2%. That's okay, too. You just put a big squirt of lidocaine ointment, 2%, on a popsicle stick. And then you flip it so that the lidocaine side is facing their tongue. And you put it back as far as you can, you know, all the way to the back of their throat. And what happens is you tell the patient not to swallow and it slowly falls down the back of their tongue into the piriform sinuses onto the epiglottis, 
and you just have them leave it there as long as they can. You tell them not to swallow, please, you know, keep it there. When it's all absorbed into the back of their throat, you can even have them gargle with it. You know, anything that's not absorbed at that point, if they can't stand it anymore, I'd actually rather them spit it than swallowing it because then you're still eliminating absorption. But if they swallow it, it's fine. So back of the pharynx with the popsicle stick, and that's going to take care of some of your posterior pharynx. All right, the transtracheal injection, if you are going to do any of the nerve blocks, is probably the one to consider. Um, but it's totally optional, and I tell you, if you're not familiar with it, don't do it. Um, it's nice because you learn, you know, it's almost like doing a needle cricothyrotomy as a bonus, but you have to really know where your anatomy is. You have to be with someone who's done this before, essentially. If you've never done it before, then don't be the first time. You know, don't let the first time happen during an actual intubation. But what you're going to do for that, um, and another reason I've stopped doing it for the most part is we don't have the equipment anymore, you need a 22-gauge angiocath that you can attach a syringe to, right? All our catheters or safety catheters that you can't attach syringes to. Um, and therefore, you really can't do this anymore. Um, so you can either order, you know, 22 gauges that attach to a syringe. Those are made. I have them uh, in 18 gauge form. Too big for this at Elmhurst. But you need a 22 gauge you can attach a syringe to. All you're going to do, if you ever got the opportunity, is you find your cricoid, uh, your thyroid, and you find your cricothyroid membrane, and then you take your 22 gauge angiocath with a syringe on it. I, I put a few cc's of saline in there so I can see air bubbles through it. And you just pop in to the trachea through your cricothyroid, and you're going to see air bubbles, right? At that point, you advance the catheter off the needle, and, and you pull out your needle, and you put your finger over it. So now you have the angiocath only, in the trachea, through the cricothyroid membrane. I'll then take my syringe of lidocaine, which is, you know, again, 4 cc's of the 2%, and attach it to the angiocath, pull back again, make sure I get air bubbles so I'm still in place, and then you just inject it really hard. Because the whole idea of it is you want the patient to cough. And when they cough, what happens is all that lidocaine spews up to the underside of the cords and the underside of their epiglottis and into the back of their airway, and you get good anesthesia that way. It's not necessary. What you could do instead, and this is very cool, um, is the transtracheal trickle method, um, just for some fun alliteration. And for that, you just take, a, again, you know, 4 cc's of lidocaine, 2%, and you put it in a syringe with like a 16-gauge angiocath on it. No needle, just the angiocath from a 16-gauge or 14-gauge. It doesn't matter. Even an 18-gauge would be fine. And you attach that to your syringe. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to grab the patient's tongue with a 4x4 four four and pull it out as far as you can. And then you push the angiocath in so it's leaning right over the very back of the tongue. All right? You can see this is what this guy he has this cool little one-hand technique. He's holding the tongue um, with a couple of his fingers out with a 4x4, four four, and then he's holding the syringe in place um, with that same hand, and that gives him his other hand free to slowly inject. And what you can do is you're just going to inject, at the beginning, very, very, very small amounts, 0.1 cc's at a time. You just drop in a, a 0.1 cc's, you tell the patient don't swallow again, you let them chill for a second. Inject another 0.1 cc's, let them chill for a second. And you keep doing that until you get the whole 4 cc's in. That's also going to leak into the piriforms. Um, if you do it very slowly, the 0.1 cc at a time, the patients don't cough. Um, and they don't get it all over your face. Though eye protection is still a good thing here. And um, you'll get pretty good anesthesia of the posterior pharynx. You're using a lot of anesthesia here. Um, and so you have to worry about your maximum anesthesia dose because some of it is absorbable. Now, what I'll tell you is you're never going to run into problems with this with the 2% crap that we have because you just don't get that high with everything we're doing. When you move to the 4% lidocaine, if you ever get it, um, it's really easy because, you know, that 4%, that's 40 milligrams per cc. Um, you, get, you get up there pretty quick. So just, you know, calculate out your max doses. Uh, what I'll tell you is the nebulized lidocaine is very little of it's absorbed, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. So don't be scared about that portion of it. It's really injections and, you know, direct um, injection or um, the dripping stuff that might go into the lungs and get absorbed that you have to worry about. All right. Now we're at the sedation portion of the talk because if we've done everything right, their entire airway now, up until the point of the cords, is topicalized. You should be able, if you needed to at this point, stick in a laryngoscope and they wouldn't react. I mean, they'd feel it, they'd be fully awake with it, but they wouldn't gag, they wouldn't cough. That's what you're trying to get here. The sedation really should just be bonus. 
right? It should just be chilling the patient out because you're sticking a big metal object in their mouth. It shouldn't be necessary. Now that being said, sometimes your topicalization isn't perfect, right? In that case, you know, the sedation is going to give you that last little oomph to allow them to, you know, to let this happen. So what do you guys want to use for sedation for your wake intubation? What's that? I hear ketamine. What else? Mm -hmm. Versed could be used, absolutely. I wouldn't use versed and fentanyl like, you know, the old school folks do for the conscious sedation. Why? So that's a pretty good, you know, track record of having patients stop breathing or at least be zonked enough that they're not going to respond to you anymore. The whole point of the sedation here is that they're chill, but they're still going to follow commands. All right? So I, I find it very difficult to titrate versed and fentanyl. Their synergy makes them, you know, want to stop breathing. So versed is okay. Ketamine is okay. What else? Propofol. Okay. Propofol how? No more potent agent to stop you from breathing than propofol, right? So you can use it, but you have to be incredibly careful, and I don't think, you know, most of us are that good at it. I know I wouldn't feel that I was good enough to titrate my propofol perfectly for this, because, you know, this is not something like um, regular conscious sedation, where it's okay if they're really sleepy and can't follow commands, they'll wake up in a little while. For that, propofol is great. Conscious sedation, propofol is a perfect agent. For this, I want them in this nice state where they'll listen to me, where they'll do what I need them to do, but they're still going to be breathing perfectly. They're still going to be, for the most part, awake. So this is what I like. Um, Versed's there. I don't use the Versed. Um, if I had someone who was really well topicalized, I might give two milligrams of Versed just for its amnestic effects. But if I really want a patient to chill out and relax, then for me, it's going to be Ketofol. That's my agent of choice, which is just a ket uh, ketamine propofol combination. You get the best of both agents. In the literature, it's spoken about one-to-one, -one, and that's fine. I use a 75% ketamine, 25% uh, propofol, because I, I think that's the mix that I like best for this awake intubation. The patients stay fully awake. Their airway reflexes are maintained entirely, but there's just enough propofol there to keep the blood pressure from going up, the pulse rate from going up, um, and to chill them out a little bit. So I mix that in the same syringe, 5 cc's of propofol, five, um, I'm sorry, that would be the one-to-one. -one. I give 7.5 cc's of ketamine and um, 2.5 cc's of propofol, same syringe. And then what you do is you just give that a cc at a time. You push, you wait a minute or so, you push, wait a minute or so, until you get them just where you want. That's the key to this is titrating in. There's no set dose. Um, if you're going to use ketamine alone, it's the same thing. Just a, a cc at a time of the ketamine until they're where you want. The best agent for this is one we don't have available though I think you guys might get it sooner than me, and that's the dexmedetomidine, or otherwise known as Presidex, and that's an agent that was based on clonidine. It's a clonidine analog that has no real blood pressure effects, but the clonidine, they found that patients were getting really, you know, whacked out, but were still breathing perfectly. It was a side effect at that point. Now it's, you know, a bonus, because you could sedate patients entirely, um, but they'll still, if you say, wake up, they'll open their eyes and say, what do you want? And they'll do what you want, but then they'll go back to sleep. But they're breathing perfectly. There's full maintenance of airway reflexes and respiratory drive. Perfect agent. Very expensive. That's why you guys don't have it yet. But will eventually revolutionize things like BiPAP, where you want to chill the patient out, but you know, want to put them to sleep with something like uh, you know, propofol or Versed. Um, and for awake intubation, another great agent. Any questions about so far? So we dried them out, we topicalized them, and now we're sedating them. All right. At this point, and we probably should have been doing it already, as soon as we were finished with topicalization, we pre oxygenate and that just is the same as before, you know. But these guys don't need a BVM, obviously, because they're awake. So just a non-rebreather mask put tightly on their face um, is going to wash out their nitrogen, give you a reserve for when you're doing the intubation. All right, now you're going to optimally position the patient, just like a regular intubation. So, you know, ears to sternal notch every time. And then you're going to restrain the patient if, you know, you have any question in your mind that they're a grabber. Because you don't want to finally get that endotracheal tube in and then have them reach up and yank it out. So I, I just put the arm restraints on the patient. I tell them, you know, this is just so that once you are intubated, this is our standard practice. And as long as they're cool with it, I do it. If they are absolutely adamant they will not want to be tied, then you need an extra nurse standing by or an extra, you know, intern standing by to be the hands person just in case they start to reach up. All right? 
At this point, when you're actually ready to do the intubation itself, you switch them to a nasal cannula. Because why not still have some degree of oxygenation during your attempt? So there's no reason to take off the non-rebreather or eliminate the oxygen entirely. They're going to be breathing. So you might as well have them breathing in the nasal cannula. Now you're going to intubate. So how do you intubate these guys? Well, if you did your topicalization perfectly, you could just do a regular, you know, direct laryngoscopy with a normal blade. But, you know, sometimes it's not going to be perfect. You might as well optimize every part of it. So for me, if you have it available, and we do at both shops, then it's going to be a fiber optical laryngoscope. So a GlideScope here at Sinai or our stores device at Elmhurst. Because you know you don't have to lift as hard on the mouth in order to get your view with the fiber optics. We know it's one grade of improvement on the cormac haynes score just by using a fiber optic device, which means you don't have to lift these guys as much. You don't have to cause them as much you know, stress on their jaw muscles. So fiber optic laryngoscope. And then what I do, this is my preference, is once I get a good view of the cords, I place a bougie in with the patient still awake. And once the bougie is fully uh, threaded in, I then paralyze and sedate the patient fully. I push my automate and my sucks. And the reason for that is, no matter how good your anesthesia is, if you didn't do that transtracheal injection, they're always going to cough a lot when you place the tube in. Um, and it, it's a little bit more traumatic. It's a little bit more annoying for the patient than just your fiber optic uh, laryngoscope and your bougie. So once my bougie's in, push my meds, and then I railroad my tube over um, on top of the bougie. If you want, at this point, if the patient's totally topicalized, you can just leave them awake and place the tube in. That's fine, too. And then once the tube's between the cords, then you can sedate and paralyze them. Um, in fact, at that point, if you did it that way, you wouldn't even have to give them the sucks. You could just give them some sedation. Uh, but for me, it's a lot cleaner once my bougie's in, push my succinylcholine, push my automidate, wait 30 seconds, put my tube in. But awake intubation is fine for any means of tube passage. So you could do retrograde intubation, right? I mean, that's actually when this becomes a clever move because we've seen some not clever retrograde intubations, right? You know, retrograde for crash. That's not what it's used for. If you have a guy, you, you know, their airway just looks ridiculous at the mouth, but they have a nice neck anatomy, um, but you don't want to crike them, obviously, you could do an awake retrograde intubation. You keep them fully awake, sedate them, you know, prep the whole neck, anesthetize the whole airway, uh, put your needle in and send your wire up through your mouth um, put your guide onto your wire, and then at that point you know you're going to be able to intubate these guys. And you could put the tube over and then only at that point fully sedate them. So awake retrograde is an option. If you're going to do blind nasal, this is the way to do it. You do full preparation. Blind nasal requires also prepping the nose, and that's a whole other lecture. But if you're going to do blind nasal on an awake patient, this is the way it happens. You could do actually awake cricothyrotomy or trace. Uh, we've done that a few times when I was at shock trauma. Folks, we just needed to get airway management, but they were maintaining their own airway better than we could for them. We did, you know, an awake um, tracheostomy. That's also an option. Lighted stylet is fine because you could fail as many times as you wanted with the lighted stylet, right? It's a fairly non-traumatic device, so you could just, you know, put it in there, move it around until you got your light just where you want it, and then intubate the patient because they're anesthetized. Obviously, the way anesthesia is going to do is a fiber optic bronchoscope, and that's fine too. Um, or you could do an ILA at this point. If you wanted to just get some you know, trial at the device, you, these patients at this point with topicalization would tolerate an ILA. It's probably not the best time to use it, but it's an option. Um, we also, at Elmhurst, we had, and then it went back to the company for repairs, and we'll have back shortly, we have a fiber optic stylet that just goes in an endotracheal tube. And so it's sort of like a fiber optic bronchoscope, except it's not that long, unwieldy thing. It's just the size of an endotracheal tube um, with a stylet that goes to the video screen. That would be perfect for this as well. Awake intubation preparation, and then just place the tube in with the video stylet. All right. You always obviously have to have a backup plan in case this fails. You know, you might need to crash RSI these guys. You might actually need to crike them. So do your preparation beforehand. All right, so then to review, you dry them out, anti-salagog, suction out the mouth, pat it till it's dry. You topicalize, which from the easiest perspective would be nebulize in lidocaine, put the lidocaine lollipop on the back of their throat, and then drip some lidocaine in with a syringe right past their tongue. You're going to sedate them. For me, it's 75% ketamine and 25% propofol in the same syringe. You're going to intubate them, and again, my method of choice would be 
for you guys a glide scope or fiber optical laryngoscopy, placement of bougie, and then railroading the tube over that, and then your normal post tube management. So there's some articles you guys can take a look at. Here's Tommy, just to end things out. Tommy's hat, I don't know if you could read it. it says he's the beer security guard. I love that. And, and that's uh, all I have. So you get what questions you guys have?